Welcome to Real People, Real Voices. I'm your host, James Jackson. I'm your co-host, Pastor Wayne Moore. Always a pleasure to host with it you. It is good to be in your presence. Man, I tell you what, we've been working together for the last two and a half years. It's been yeah. phenomenal. I, I hope the city's been blessed at what we're trying to do and convey to them with all the information that is out there. And I'm glad that the Lord has used us as the vessels to do that. Absolutely. And I think we ought to uh, say Happy Thanksgiving, which is probably already passed. Yes. That's by okay. the time this show airs. Yeah. But Merry Christmas. Yeah. And Happy New Year is coming up to yeah. all of you. Yeah. Let's recognize our sponsors before we go any Absolutely. further. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Lee Castle and Crawley. And we have the Fervent Care Christian Academy. Uh, and we have the Up and Over coming up and on December 1. And I hope we can uh, make sure you be out there to support Martin University. And we also want to encourage you to go to YouTube. WHMB TV 40 YouTube channel and subscribe to this broadcast. You can watch this one when it's over as well as others that you might have missed. And go to Facebook. Like, like us on Facebook. Yeah, like <laughs> us on Facebook. I like that phrase. Like us on Facebook. And keep watching us on Sundays at 5.30 p.m. and on Friday nights at 9.30. Right. You'll be tremendously blessed. You know, we have great guests today. Uh, Miss Boards, all the way from Anderson. Yeah. You know, this show is reaching uh, different cities. And so we have people here from Anderson today. Uh, with us, and they're going to be talking about early child development and uh, the Excel Learning Center that is there in Anderson, Indiana. And Miss Boards is here with us, and we're going to sit back and let her tell us what's happening yeah. with that academy. And she's been doing that for 16 years. Yes, yes. Um, of course, more experience in that, but uh, doing a tremendous job there. Yeah. Anytime you can help a young person develop, that's that's dynamic. Yeah. So stay with us. We have a lot to come. You'll be tremendously blessed. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices, and we are joined by Ms. Sherry Boards. She is the CEO of the Excel Learning Academy. Welcome yeah. to the show. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Tell us about Excel. Well, Excel, I have been in business for about 16 years. I am the CEO of the Academy. Um, we have ages infants through 12-year-olds. Uh, we have two locations on the east side and the west side. Have approximately 80 students. Um, it's a private school. We put God first. Um, our mission statement is basically to implement Christian um, character and uh, high academic standards. Um, I like what you said about that, the mm -hmm. Christian character, which is spiritual formation. Yes. Which is something we really need for our communities there in Anderson and other places throughout central Indiana. Mm -hmm. And you have several different uh, areas uh, on my way pre K. Uh, tell us about some of the other offerings that you have there. We have several programs to offer. First of all, we're on, uh, we offer CCDF, mm -hmm. and that's um, Child Care Development Funding. A lot of our students are low-income students. Mm -hmm. So CCDF provides a lot of opportunities for low-income families to get private education. We also have On My Way Pre-K, and that's a government program that the government is finally stepping up to the plate to know the importance of early childhood, early childhood education. So. If you're uh, four by August the 1st, it's another funding, just like CCDF, to pay for private education or just for, for educational learning for your students for, for uh, preschool, preparing, preparing them for kindergarten. How did so, you get the vision for this? Yeah. It was God. Uh -oh. It really was. Thanks it really be was. To God. It was. Praise God for that. Because I started off in business. I was with AT&T for about 16 years in marketing. Mm -hmm. But I've always taught something. I've taught Sunday school. I used to teach Mary Kay. I've done junior achievement for many years. And that was my heart was to really teach. To, to pour and, into other people. Yes, it really was. And so when I left AT&T, I went to a headhunter, mm -hmm. paid them quite a bit of money to tell me I need to be a teacher, <laughs> which I already kind of knew that. Yeah. So I start off do, started doing this in my home. Um, and I started with 12 students. And I did in my home for about three years. And after that, I started buying some real estate. And this shows you how God was in the plan because, <clears throat> excuse me, my mother got me into real estate. So I bought several real estate properties. I was able to take my school from my home to put it into my, one of my duplexes. I went from 12 kids to 28 kids within a month wow. or less. Just, yeah. And it's been growing ever since. I went up to 112 children. Um, so all my properties are my own personal properties, and they're located next side by side. So it's more like a campus. Okay. 
So for example, on the west side, I have a four unit, dupla a four unit uh, apartment building and a house across the street. So all those were, were, we also did first and second grade at that time. Mm -hmm. We taught first, second grade and kindergarten. So we divide the children up by uh, their age and by the academics. So each house was ran like a child care center, even though there were separate units. And then on the east side, I did the same thing. All of them are next door to each other. So they divide up by age as well as academics. And so I ran it like a child care center, but my goal was to get the property so when I retire, those <laughs> properties would be paid off yeah. and that would be part of my retirement. So like I said, after 16 years, I'm down to six units instead of 10 mm -hmm. that I had. I still own them, but I'm just functioning out of six. Right. Because I'm really looking more of a child care center now mm -hmm. because it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. You know, by having 10 phone bills and 10 light bills <laughs> and going grocery shopping for 10 separate units. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of looking into that right now as getting a We're child care center. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because in Anderson, we really don't have a whole lot of child care centers. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of child care homes, mm -hmm. or there's a lot of um, child care services inside the church. Yeah. We don't have a lot of standalone buildings. Okay. And so um, as time went on, I'm just kind of getting weary. I'm just ready to have one convenient location. We're praying that it happens. You're going to have that. You're going to have it, yeah. yeah. Tell, yeah. Us, uh, tell us, just give us a, uh, an example. You say uh, you worked at AT&T, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, you paid a headhunter uh, X amount of dollars yes. uh, to tell you what you already knew. Yeah. So we're going to give you an opportunity to show us what you already know. Tell us what you have here. Okay, our program, we teach the ABECA curriculum, first of all. Okay. And ABECA is a wonderful, it's a Christian program, first of all. And they um, use Sunday school, I love it, or you can homeschool with it. Mm -hmm. And so they're known for their reading. And so when I quit my job, I found out about this program. And we had, I had children as young as three and a half years old to four years old reading. And Anderson Community Schools would come out to my home wondering how I'm getting all these children, especially minority kids, mm -hmm. to read so early and also be able to comprehend. And Becca did that. And yeah, Becca did that. Yeah. Because they teach basic phonics. They don't really do that too much in school nowadays. More, today is more like picture word relation type reading. Basic phonics is so key so you can learn how to sound out a word. So, for example, and I wanted to show you this because you can have a child reading quickly without knowing every letter of the alphabet, but the key also is comprehension. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in knowing how to read if you don't, don't know how to comprehend. Right. So what we did, this what I, it's, it's called the blend ladder, mm -hmm. and this is through a Becca uh, program as well. And the first thing we teach the children is the vowels. You know, A-E-I-O-U, teach them their sounds, <coughs> A, E, E, A, A. When we were coming up, for the, for example, the word mat, we would sound out each letter, M, mm, at, mm -hmm. three sounds. Mm -hmm. Well, Becca teaches them to make the first two letters mm -hmm. one sound. Right. Okay. So, for example, these blend letters, it, it would go like this, M sound is M, mm, A sound is A, we go M, mm, A, ma, M, mm, E, ma, Mm, I, me, mm, ah, ma, mm, ah, ma, ma, me, me, ma, ma. When the children are learning this, it sounds so rhythmically, you mm -hmm. know. So they get into that, so that everybody goes, ma, me, me, ma, ma. Mm -hmm. You make it fun for them, but they're actually learning how to read. These two sounds now become one. Mm -hmm. So all they know at this moment, they know all the vowel sounds. That's the first thing we teach them. We teach them what a consonant is, even at a three year old, they know what a, what a consonant is versus a vowel. Teach the consonant, and say if we were to add the consonant T over here, for mm -hmm. example, this word would be ma, then t, put it together, mat, me, t, mat, so, so forth. Mat, so you got them reading quickly. Um, and so that's kind of, I'm just really fond of the Becca program because it really teach them about, teaches them about basic phonics. We also have to teach our parents basic phonic sounds, because a lot of adults yeah. don't know our sounds. And for example, um, I had one parent, I never forget, I asked them, what's the TR sound? And most of us would say the TR sound is tra. Mm -hmm. It's not true, because the U sound is uh, okay? So you put in TR with the U sound, tra. TR is just tur, because T is t, R is er, and you blend it as tur. So what I do is I work with the parents. I have a workshop for the parents, the kids get homework twice a week. So you're teaching parents I am. Phonics. I teach the parents how, because when you get your homework, you can't help the child right. if you don't know how to pronounce the letters yourself. Right. Most people want to call the letter M, M, mm -hmm. 
M is mm. If you want to call it ma, you say mm, uh, ma. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm asking for. I want the M sound. It's just simply mm. So, um, our program is wonderful. Um, like I said, I've been doing a Becca for 16 years. We have other curriculums that we add to that, but they have a wonderful reading program. And it's just, just working with the basic phonic sounds well, you're and very, teaching the parents. You're very passionate about I this. I am very passionate <laughs> because, you know, reading, if you can't read, you can't do math. Right. You know, reading is everything, and, and, and you have to be able to comprehend. Right, yeah. So you, you can have a smart four-year-old that can read, but he can't comprehend anything. That didn't help either. Mm -hmm. So we teach our parents when we do, they do homework, if they're doing any type of reading or when the parents read to them, always ask questions. Don't read the whole story first. Yeah. Read maybe a paragraph at a time and then ask a question so they can make sure that they understand what they're learning. Sister the comprehension. Yeah. yeah, you've been a great guest. Yes, you have. Yeah. We're out of time. We're out oh, of time. That was quick. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> you did a good job, though. Okay. Yeah. All the best to what you're okay. working on. and your To the Excel and Center. We, we hope you get that one location. She's going to get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I need that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. We've got a little more to come, so stay with us. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices, and we're joined by Mr. Tony Gillespie. He is the Vice President of Public Policy and Engagement for the Indiana Minority Health Coalition. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So talk to us about uh, your responsibility and role there at the Indiana Minority Health Coalition. Um, Indiana Minority Health Coalition, we're a statewide organization, and we specifically address health disparity and chronic health conditions that disproportionately affect minority communities. So around the state, we have 22 affiliates and coalitions that we work with. Um, they provide primarily community-based education, uh, chronic disease reduction, health fairs, anything that addresses um, a chronic health condition that disproportionately affects minority communities. And on my side of the house, the public policy and advocacy, we work specifically with policymakers on laws, um, legislation that's passed, and to make sure that there's the minority voice and representation there. So if it's something that is beneficial to minorities across the state, we advocate for it. If it's something that may not be beneficial or harmful, then we advocate Which is a hard job. Absolutely, Very absolutely. But, um, you know, our legislature, um, we have, uh, there are 150 total elected officials around the state. Um, and our stronghold, um, you know, of course, m most of Indiana is a rural state. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, you know, educating what impacts some uh, urban area versus mm -hmm. how that affects a, a rural legislature, why, why, mm -hmm. a, why an elected official representing a largely rural community should be concerned about it. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that, you know, in terms of um, our state, we have a ranking, and Indiana is in the latter percentile in terms of our overall state health. And we believe that minority health is everybody's business because it affects us all one way or another. Mm -hmm. And if we can fix some of the health disparities and disconnects around health care access and treatment services for minority communities, we fix the state. What is the best way for folks who are in our viewing audience to connect with the services you all offer? Um, if you give us a call at 317-926-4011, uh, and you can ask for me, Tony Gillespie, um, we are absolutely looking for volunteers and interested parties that are interested in the same kind of issue. Mm -hmm. um, this year, uh, we're going to do a big um, Minority Health Day, Minority Health Action Day at the Indiana State House uh, on March 13th, and mm -hmm. we're looking for volunteers and supporters and folks who will, will attend. It's really important in terms of any um, legislative endeavor, in terms of any legislation, that um, our elected, elected officials have to hear from us. Mm -hmm. We're the constituency. Um, if they don't hear, hear from us, they're making decisions without community input. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's critical that we're part of their process. The opiate situation. Uh, at one time, it was kind of located in one community, but now it's moving mm -hmm. into other communities. Absolutely. Uh, how is it looking in the minority community now? So, um, coming from the perspective of what you just shared, that it was more prevalent or it seemed to originate 
in non-minority communities. Right. There had been no focus on the minority community, no conversation on the minority community. And I, I liken it, since I'm old, I think about when we were doing HIV work and it started originally as a gay white disease, that's what it was seen as, that's what policies were developed and programs and um, services. And so when it began to transition to a minority health issue, we were kind of like stuck. We didn't know what to do. There were no resources. There were no anything. Mm -hmm. So thinking in that same vein, what IMHC did, we last year, or earlier this year, we did a virtual town hall meeting where we had our all of our affiliates around the state host um, a live stream meeting where we had a, we brought specialists together in a panel and we just discussed the opioid impact on minority communities in Indiana. And we know that the overdose incidences are increasing in minority communities, pr predominantly African American. Um, we know that African Americans don't get their opioids or they don't get addicted on, on drugs, that's what it is, they don't get addicted through prescription. They get addicted through buying on the street because historically African Americans don't get those prescriptions. We don't get 30 days of Vicodin or 30 days of Oxycontin. Um, we buy that off the street. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the epidemic in the minority community. And it's not very different to what it was in the 80s and the 90s. And so we, we, did this, we did this town hall meeting and the organization that we worked with, Side Effect Media and WFYI Television thought it was so great they reformatted it and now it's an opioid documentary that we're going around the state showing. I saw showing, that. I right? saw that. And so where we're at now is that we need to determine what has to happen in the minority community. There were resources that were, resource allocations that were made over the last three to five years in the legislature where now Medicaid dollars can be used to pay for treatment. Right. Um, so there's also research that supports now that minorities don't get the option of treatment. So, but that's because jail or imprisonment is the point of entry. Right. for so much of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, you know, it's a, it's, a, a, it's a legal issue because you're breaking the law by using drugs, but it's a health issue, a minority health issue, mm -hmm. because you're addicted on drugs and that kills you. Mm -hmm. So we have to move this from a, a, a law enforcement issue, change the narrative to make it a public health issue so we can address it in public health spaces. Because what has happened so far is that the resources made available through the jails primarily go to white and black skin incarceration. Right. So then we run the risk of sliding back to the historic war on drugs that warranted, we didn't get any gains out of that other than more black people in jail. Right. Uh, we have about a minute 30 left. Okay. And we've got, uh, I, want, I want you to speak to- I keep to, running my mouth, okay. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> you're good. To speak to uh, a couple of town halls coming up. Okay. And the action day. Okay. Um, we are, um, right now we're working with PBS stations around the state mm -hmm. to air the opioid um, documentary and that's primarily in parts of the state where there are minority communities. Mm -hmm. So that's our campaign right now. Um, what we have scheduled is on December 8th and January, whatever day, sorry, December 11th and January 8th, mm -hmm. 8th we're doing another virtual town hall series, a set uh, to address um, black infant mortality and black maternal mortality. Right. Mm -hmm. We'll do a prenatal portion and a postpartum portion. Um, we're looking for statewide participation on that. And then March 13th at the Indiana State House is the Minority Health Action Day. That's where we'll bring all of our coalitions from around the state and we'll bring other supporter, supporting agencies and we're just gonna talk about the Please. importance of the minority health issue and funding and some of the things that we're working on and some of the things that we still need to work on. Funding is a big part of it. Yes. Well, thank you for all the work that you all do. Thank you. And thank you for this format, this forum. Thank, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome, thanks for coming. And thank you all for watching. We've got the rundown right after this, so don't go away. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Real People, Real Voices. I'm your host, James Jackson. Co-host, Pastor Wayne Moore. And I'm Sherry Big Davis, your executive producer. And what a wonderful couple of segments there. It was. It was. I think we had, we had a lot to, to, to be uh, 
grateful to hear, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just grateful to hear what we, we got, especially early child development with yeah. these boards. Yeah. Uh, and she was really passionate about that. Very passionate, and, and uh, not only was she passionate, uh, but uh, she's passionate about parents and learning how mm -hmm. to get hooked on phonics again. Yeah, <laughs> which is important. It is important. Yeah, you know, Sherry, a lot of times, you, as uh, she said, you can teach the children, but then the homework comes home, mm -hmm. And if the parents are not able to help the children with the homework, it kind of defeats the purpose. That's very important. And, and what she's teaching is not just the children, but the parents as well, because we want our children to grow and excel. You know, and reading is a very, very important and foundational component of that. You know, Sherry, I thought it was very uh, phenomenal to find out that there are just not many standalone daycare systems there mm -hmm. uh, in Anderson. Yes. Anderson is, is a pretty, pretty big city. It's not a large city, but it's, it's, it's big enough. It has a large population of uh, Afro-Americans there. Mm -hmm. And you would think that, that, that they would have more daycare facilities and uh, um, early child development uh, schools. Yeah. yeah, we always are trying to, you know, as community service providers, find those pathways mm -hmm. to education, starting mm -hmm. with early childhood education. And we are seeing more of them emerge, but we would like for them to be those licensed centers mm -hmm. that are teaching children the High things performing. that they, yes, yeah, sir, yeah. That, that they need to be teaching so that they'll grow and excel in their learning. Yeah. That's phenomenal. And certainly uh, with Mr. Gillespie talking about oh, man. all yeah. the different things that they're doing. Those four dimensions of the father in the biblical context was phenomenal. That yeah. was phenomenal. So um, thank you all for joining us. We've had a wonderful time with you. Please be sure to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can watch this show when it's over as well as others that you might have missed. Also go to our Facebook page and like us on Facebook. I certainly want to thank our sponsors, Lee Kossel and Crawley and Fervent Care, Child Care, and Christian Academy. We look forward to our next time together with you. God bless you.